Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Kate Merriweather. I'm here from the Publications Committee of the American Neurogynecologic Society. Today, we'll be interviewing Dr. Colleen McDermott, who is the first author on a recent clinical consensus statement from OGS on postoperative urinary retention following pelvic surgery. Thank you for being here with us today, Dr. McDermott. Oh, thank you for having me, Dr. Merriweather. So first thing we all want to know is how did you and your group decide on the important points of focus for this clinical consensus document? So all of us that were working in this uh, in this group had some sort of research and clinical background in the area of postoperative urinary retention, or POR, which is the acronym that we used in the manuscript. So we all came in with somewhat of a sense of the important research questions around this topic. We started out by narrowing our focus to female patients who've had pelvic reconstructive surgery for prolapse and or stress urinary incontinence that had failed an initial avoiding trial after their procedure, focusing on all the medical and surgical interventions that would occur in the first six weeks after surgery. We did our initial literature search, and from these resources, the group decided that the focus would first be on determining an accurate definition for poor, and then identified generalized topic areas relevant to poor, of which we identified six. And these included the incidence of poor, medication, patient factors, surgical factors that could impact poor, the utility of urodynamic studies in the evaluation of poor, and voiding trials in the diagnosis and management of poor. With our group discussions, we first came up with the definition of poor, as well as 37 questions to be considered for inclusion. And then we developed draft statements based on these. We then did a second, more robust literature search, and this was done related to these specific questions. And we then refined our draft statements based on all of this information. Once the statements were finalized, then the Delphi process began. And after three Delphi rounds, 34 statements reached consensus and three statements were omitted. What were some of the hot points of controversy for this document? So after our first Delphi, 10 statements were revised and then considered for a second Delphi, all of which then reached consensus thereafter. So just to review those 10 areas of debate, the statement on the use of local anesthetic at the time of surgery was amended to discuss that it has not been shown to increase poor. The statement on sling tensioning and poor was amended to discuss the decreased rate of poor with using a Babcock to do the tensioning. The statement on impact of blood loss during surgery was changed to reflect that the data on the amount of blood loss and its impact on poor are conflicting. The statement on urodynamic studies to investigate poor was amended to state the literature on this is limited to come to any sort of conclusion. The discussion on the statement of the preferred method for bladder drainage was primarily around terminology, and it was decided that we should be using transurethral indwelling catheter, intermittent self-catheterization, and suprapubic catheter. Finally, another statement on voiding trial method, although it did reach consensus in the first round, there was some discussion on the inclusion of force of stream as a method for voiding trial. So the literature was reviewed through a group discussion, and then it was felt that there was a this was a well-studied method and should be included. One question had to then go to a third Delphi as new data was presented in the interim of this process. And this was the statement that looked at the use of alpha blockers after surgery to treat poor. There actually is level one evidence that does show that tamsulosin, which is an oral alpha blocker, can reduce the incidence of poor after pelvic surgery. But on review in the third Delphi, only 60% agreed with this statement and therefore it was omitted. And just as a side note, after the first two, after the first Delphi, two questions were omitted because the working group felt there was insufficient evidence on both topics that would warrant their inclusion into the body of the paper. And these were on interventions to induce pelvic floor relaxation after surgery and an attempt to reduce poor and post-operative constipation, increasing the risk of poor. A lot to digest there. What do you think are some of the two or three most important take-home points from this document? So poor is a common outcome after surgery for prolapse and incontinence, ranging between anywhere from 15 to 45 percent in the literature. And without a diagnosis and treatment, it can lead to significant postoperative morbidity. There are many perioperative risk factors that can predispose a patient to poor. And there is currently no consensus among surgeons on how to diagnose or manage this issue, which was abundantly clear throughout the process. 
So the main goal of this clinical consensus statement and why everyone in our AUGS community should read this document was to summarize our existing evidence around these six focused topic areas and then really to identify important topics for future research. What do you think are the biggest needs as far as future research, um, research on the poor topic? So we did pull out a few things that really needed to be looked at. There are big research needs around preoperative medications, specifically as many of our patients are on oral medications for overactive bladder. We need pharmacologic and clinical studies to look at whether or not these medications should be discontinued before surgery or not. The group also thought that we needed better quality studies around the use of bethanicol perioperatively to reduce pore and specifically a study that compares bethanicol to tamsulosin. There's also significant inconsistency among studies with regard to the classification and management of patients with poor. Specifically, we really need standardization of the voiding trial passing criteria for each of the different voiding trial types. And we also need more evidence on how to best manage patients with poor after they go home. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing some of these important points with us today, Dr. McDermott. Everyone in the community, please take the chance to read this clinical consensus document in the April 2023 issue of Urogynecology.